All right. Uh, yeah, hang on. Just trying to get set up here. Tonight's study. Uh, we'll take a look at the first resurrection. Actually, this is a, a review. Uh, you know, I've been going back and forth uh, for some time now with uh, the resurrection, the first resurrection, more specifically the verse we find in uh, the book of Revelation. And what I'm going to offer tonight, Lord willing, uh, might be a little bit different than the way that I used to look at this verse. And of course, which is not surprising, the resurrection itself, I think the Bible will confirm that it is Christ. It is Christ. Anyone here disagree with that? That the resurrection is Christ. We read this in John chapter 11 verse 24. Martha saith unto him, I know that he, in a context there is talking about Lazarus, he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day at the last day and it's interesting how Christ here in the next verse he says uh, I am the resurrection John 11 25 Jesus said unto her I am the resurrection and the life he that believeth in me though he were dead yet shall he live well you know <laughs> just like uh, you know, study that I offered uh, some time back about denying the resurrection, where I was looking at the fact that it is the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the unsaved in the body of Christ who deny Christ. They deny the resurrection. In essence, who are they denying? They deny Christ. But take a look at uh, Luke chapter 20, verse 36. Also, neither can they die anymore. They are equal unto the angels and are the children of God, being the children of the resurrection. Children of God, children of Christ, children of the resurrection. I think it's pointing, Lord willing, to the same event, right? The resurrection of Christ is spiritual, happening today, I believe. But Christ himself is that resurrection. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 35 women receive their dead raised to life again and others were tortured not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection green eyes hi welcome just started the uh, Bible study here called the first resurrection we're looking at a verse that we read in Revelation chapter 20 we're gonna get to that in a minute uh, but right now I'm offering that the resurrection itself, according to the Bible, uh, when we try to put together uh, some of these verses, we find that it is Christ himself. I am. He is the great I am. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the, sh the door. Right? We also read elsewhere in the Bible. And then in verse 35 of Hebrews 11, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. Who would that be? In other words, this seems to be talking about a resurrection associated with Christ, right? That they might obtain a better resurrection. And I mentioned just now about those who deny the resurrection. In essence, what they're doing is that they are denying Christ. Luke chapter 20 verse 27. Then came to him certain of the Sadducees which deny that there is a resurrection. And they asked him. Now the reason I think this language is interesting because we also read in 2 Peter 2 1 about those who deny the Lord that bought them. And really if you think about it it was typifying whom? <clears throat> who denied Christ? Not once, not twice, but three times. Who denied Christ? Any thoughts on that? 
Yeah, Peter denied Christ, and Judas betrayed Christ. And both uh, Judas and Peter were really symbolizing the church, right? And so when we read about those who deny the Lord that bought them, they are denying Christ. So if they deny the resurrection, saying the resurrection is past already, in essence they're saying that Christ is, uh, well, that there is no resurrection. So in other words, there is no salvation in Christ. But that's another study, uh, you know, that's on the, uh, the website, Lord willing, uh, for those interested. Denying the resurrection. Acts chapter 17, verse 32. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. And who are those that mock today spiritually? Again, those in the body of Christ. A man's foes will be they of his own household. Psalm 35, verse 16. With hypocritical mockers and feasts, they gnashed upon me with their teeth. It was also typified, I believe, by um, what we read in uh, Genesis 21, verse 9. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian. Well, I think in this picture is uh, pointing to the church, which she had borne unto him, mocking. So those who mock, these are the ones that are in the body itself, right? They're not really coming from the outside. At least spiritually, they're not. We have to stay with uh, the definition, I believe, that God gives us in the Bible. So, the resurrection I propose, it is Christ himself. I am the resurrection. So I think we're going to see that those that are raised with Christ, or they take part in the first resurrection, well, how do we understand this language here? What about the first is God talking about first here in the context of chronology? That's what I used to think. That's really what I used to think. That God is talking about those who rise first, or those who have part in the first resurrection, which would seem to identify with those who were beheaded for the witness of Jesus. And we're going to look at that in a few minutes. But isn't it interesting that Christ again is spoken of as being what? He is the first and and what? Yeah. He is the firstborn. He is the first and the last. Very interesting uh, language, you know. And and sometimes we kind of glance over these verses. I know I do. And we don't really see Lord willing the spiritual until we began to see how all of this information really had substance until we began to you know we start looking for a missing piece of the puzzle and now we 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 might bring some of these verses into focus acts 26 verse 23 that christ should suffer and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead he is the first we follow in his footstep right the the believers they follow in his footsteps. But he was the first. He is the firstborn and the first that should rise from the dead. And also the idea of rising. We think also of salvation. Colossians 2.12 Buried with him in baptism. Wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God. Christ rises. The believers rise. And so rising then, it is the language of salvation, I believe, right? 1 Corinthians 15, 22, As in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But you know, uh, to make matters a little bit uh, more complicated, God gives us two sets of people in the end that are rising. Two sets. Now, they belong to the body of Christ, it's just that the, uh, the, the chronology, the events, we read first about those who uh, are beheaded for the witness of uh, Christ. And that would also include the two witnesses that are killed, right? Coming into the Great Tribulation. And yet God speaks of those that are gathered in a time when Christ is revealed. 
Verse 23, But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. Now I don't think this is simply talking about the believers living at the time uh, that Christ is revealed. I think God there has in view the whole body. The whole body is going to rise. Because Christ, as we've mentioned before, is not separated from the body. But notice here again that Christ, the first fruits, so he is the first. Revelation 22, 13. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. What about Revelation 2, 5? Repent, therefore, and again, this is another verse, I think, uh, you read that, but you're not really, you know, paying attention to the word first, how this has to relate to Christ. Repent and do the first works. In other words, one has to be faithful, and we can only be faithful in whom? In Christ. He is the very essence of faith. And do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick. Revelation 1, verse 5. Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead. I don't think it's a coincidence that God makes mention or reference to Christ being the first and the last, the first fruits. So it all really focuses around him. It focuses on Christ himself. Exodus 23, 19. The first of the first fruits of thy land thou shalt bring into the house of the Lord thy God. There again, I think this is really uh, pointing to Christ. Exodus 4, verse 22. And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. Now, between Isaac and Esau, who was the firstborn? Who was the firstborn? Oh, I'm sorry, Jacob and Esau, right? I get those mixed up sometimes. Yeah, Esau was the firstborn. But you notice how God associates Esau with the church? He typifies the church, right? The body of Christ. More specifically, the unsaved body. The one who sold uh, his birthright for a bowl of soup. And so that's the church, I believe. See, they had the, uh, they had the priority. They uh, really were considered to be first in a time when uh, God the Holy Spirit was dwelling in the midst. And so the first relates to Christ. Mimos, hi, welcome. The first relates to Christ himself. He is the first and the last. He is the firstborn, like Esau. But what happened? Because the church lost the birthright, now it has become what? It has become last. And that's, what, that's how I think uh, we might be able to understand another verse that I'm going to post in a minute. Uh, so Israel, right? pointing to Christ again, is the firstborn. That's the people of God. The children of Israel that were in the land of Egypt when God was getting ready to redeem the people. Israel is my firstborn. Exodus chapter 13, verse 15. And it came to pass, when Pharaoh would hardly let us go, that the Lord slew all the firstborn. Well, what does that mean? What is the significance of God slaying the firstborn in the land of Egypt which would have been the last plague right that came on the land of Egypt coinciding with the Passover yeah precisely Eric God is judging the church the church identified with Christ it was first like Esau right like Esau the church identified with Christ um, Matthew 19, verse 30, But many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Hold on one second.
Yeah, this guy, all he does is he comes into the room and, and posts, uh, you know, some things, and then he, he runs. That's why I put the red dot on him as soon as he walked in. Okay, yeah, so, yeah, the God is judging the church. Matthew chapter 19, verse 30, but many that are first. Yeah, matter of fact, that's the, uh, the other verse that I was going to post. Thanks, Eric. Uh, in Mark chapter 10, verse 31, same thing. But many that are first shall be last, and the last first. So the church was considered to be first, the firstborn. But yet, the one who receives the blessing is the younger, right? Jacob. And so it's not surprising, again, to see how God is associating uh, the word first with Christ himself. So now when we come to the verse that speaks of the first resurrection, does this imply that there is a second resurrection? What do you think? Does God speak of a second resurrection in the Bible? I don't think so. We might assume that. Oh, he does? Where, Greg? Can you share uh, what verse in the Bible where God speaks of or implies a second resurrection? Now, I know when we look at those that are alive and remain, we begin to see that God is gathering today. There are those that are being gathered into the kingdom through uh, God unsealing the Bible. But I'm not aware of uh, you know a place in the Bible where God speaks of that as a second resurrection. As a matter of fact, I think some... Uh, would imply, and I heard someone mention the other day, that the first resurrection that we read about in Revelation chapter 20 is talking about the resurrection of the soul. Not so sure. Okay, no problem. Uh, I used to think that, or at least suspected that it, it might be a possibility, but I don't think we have enough information in the Bible to conclude that, to say, well, the first resurrection is when someone uh, becomes saved, when they are sealed, and that's the resurrection of the soul. And now the second resurrection is the resurrection on the last day. But can you see the problem perhaps with that? Because now by God's grace we're learning that uh, God really is not giving us information regarding the, the very last day. And so we can assume that that resurrection is pointing to uh, what happens at the end of the world. So we're looking at the resurrection today. Come out of her, my people, Babylon is fallen. The hour cometh when all that are in the grave shall hear his voice. So if that is spiritual, then that first resurrection there, I don't think we'll be talking about the resurrection of the soul when someone becomes saved. So many that are first shall be last and the last first. What about now having part in the first resurrection? Can you see how this seems to point to the redemption of of the body of Christ those who take part in the first resurrection I'm getting to that <laughs> yeah we're getting there uh, Bobby just bear with me one second just want to make sure <laughs> just want to make sure we're on the same page at least uh, or try to be uh, when we analyze some of these verses Revelation chapter 20 verse 2 and he laid hold on a dragon that old serpent which is a devil and Satan and bound him a thousand years now, again, here's a situation where uh, God, I think, He gave us the impression when the, uh, the Bible was sealed, we would not have understood these verses the way we understand how they relate to uh, what's going on today in the body of Christ. And so I think it was okay that we uh, tie these verses into the cross. In other words, Christ came and He bound Satan a thousand years. And the end of the thousand years now means that we come into the Great Tribulation. Uh, there might be a, a, a tie in there, but I think today we, we understand that, you know, Lord willing, the Bible is always current events. So that God, it seems, He has written these verses in such a way that there's a dual meaning. And so today, the way I think we have to understand these verses is that the binding of Satan is God's judgment on, on, on Babylon. And Christ is revealed, now it is the day of the Lord, and God now begins a separation of wheat and tares. 
Now in verse 3, and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal. Now we've talked a little bit about this before. The reason Satan is cast into the bottomless pit was so that he should deceive the nations no more. And when we search the Bible, it seems that deception has everything to do with, with what? Take heed that no man deceive you when the question was raised. What shall be the sign of thy coming? That's the time when antichrists are loose, the thieves, the murderers, the false prophets. They are uh, loose. Satan exalts his throne above the stars of God. And that's why there's a great deal of deception I propose today in the body of Christ. Many shall come in my name saying, I am. So we notice here that Satan is bound that he would no longer deceive the nations. And I think this is the language of this is language of the depart out, the separation. That he should deceive the nations no more till a thousand years should be fulfilled. And then we begin to see that God has one final uh, mission, it seems, for Satan, that he is going to be loose and and go into perdition. The days when men would seek death and would not find it. Why? Well, because, again, it seems 144,000 would have been sealed. Hurt not the earth, neither the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. So he is loose, the little season. I know, again, you know, we used to look at these verses. I know that's been the case for me. And relating it to the cross. And if we do that today, I propose, Lord willing, that we're not going to understand how these verses apply spiritually to today so in verse 4 and I saw thrones and they that's why again you know just look at verse 4 you see how God seems to go right into what's going on in the day of judgment so that verses 2 and 3 would not seem to relate primarily to the cross because the moment we read, after that he must be loose a little season, and I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. What is that thousand years? Is that a literal period of time? Is a thousand years referring? No, I don't think so, Eric. Is a thousand years referring to the New Testament church age? I don't think it is either. You know, the numbers in the Bible today, I think we're beginning to see perhaps that they convey the gospel. So the number thousand here in this context, the context would uh, seem to define the number. It's talking about salvation. To live and reign with Christ a thousand years is to come into the kingdom of God. That makes sense? So they lived and reigned with Christ. Yeah, well, yeah, they come into the kingdom and, you know, then they are forever with the Lord. But it begins with uh, God's judgment on Babylon and the separation. So they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Now, here's the catch. Take a look at verse 5. And that did not post. Hold on. Too many colors. In verse 5 we read, But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Now I happen to think, uh, we'll talk a little more about the rest of the dead. Matter of fact, I think uh, there's a whole other study that I'd like to share, Lord willing, uh, to show that there are two sides to the rest of the dead. And again, that's not surprising because two things are happening today, I believe. It is what? Judgment and salvation. That's the gospel, right? Yeah. There's judgment on Babylon. And at the same time, at the same time, God is destroying the unsaved in the body. But let's assume for now, and I'm going to use the illustration here, that the rest of the dead is pointing to those who come after. In other words, those that are alive and living at the time of the revelation of Christ. The rest of the dead live not again 
until the thousand years were finished. Now this thousand years, again, I, I propose it's not a literal passage of time. God is uh, going back to this to show that two things happen at the revelation of Christ, I believe, is that Satan is set aside. And then right after that, God's plan for him is to allow him to go loose to destroy completely the rest of the body. Because I gave her space to repent of her fornication and she repented not and now time is no more. Now, here's the question. The rest of the dead here, would this be talking about, I mean, just looking at the context, would this be talking about those that died prior to the church coming into tribulation? Or... Is this talking about the believers living at the time when Christ was revealed? The Bible is unsealed. What do you think? Yeah, that's what we read on the surface of this verse. And again, this is a reason why we have to raise another question. If that's the case, if the rest of the dead here is talking about those that are living today, and I used to think that, wait a minute, maybe God is recapping so that the rest of the dead is going back to those that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus. And that might be a possibility. But I think uh, in the context here, we read the rest of the dead live not again until a thousand years were finished. Meaning that God now has those that are alive and remain. He is going to bring them into the kingdom as well because it is the end. But you notice here it says this is the first resurrection. Well, how can that be? Right, right. As far as I can see, uh, Bobby. But if this is true, if the rest of the dead here is talking about those that are living today, why would God say this is the first resurrection? And before you answer that, let me pose First uh, Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Now, I believe that there is a connection between the two here. Do you? Do you see a connection between 1 Thessalonians 4.16 and Revelation 25? The dead in Christ shall rise first. This is the first resurrection. I don't think it's an accident. The language itself would seem to indicate. But I don't believe there is a chronology when it comes to the first resurrection. Everyone is going to rise in Christ. Now, look at the conflict, or at least what I believe to be a conflict, between verse 5 of Revelation 20. If we say that the rest of the dead here is talking about the believers living at the time when Christ is revealed, what about 1 Thessalonians 4.16? Would this be talking about the believers living at this time? Or does this seem to imply those who come with Christ, those who were uh, beheaded, those who died prior to the church coming into the Great Tribulation? Understand the question? What I'm trying to relate here is that do we see the language here to be the same, but yet the group, the category of people to be different? On the one hand, if we say, well, the rest... Yeah, if we say the rest of the dead is talking about those living today, and yet they take part in the first resurrection, well, what about 1 Thessalonians 4.16? When Christ comes and says the dead in Christ shall rise first, can you see why this is another reason, other than the fact that we understand that Christ is the resurrection, that the first resurrection, there's really no chronology to it. It is the language of salvation. It is to rise with Christ. And it doesn't really matter whether it's those that lived previously or those that are living today at the time when Christ is revealed. Everyone is rising first because first is pointing to whom? Yeah, 
No, the, the word first, I believe, is pointing to Christ, ultimately. In this context, we're looking at salvation, right? So first resurrection is the language of salvation. Isn't that interesting? Well, that, that's consistent with everything else, Lord willing, that we're learning in the Bible. It is a language of judgment or salvation. It's just that God can use a variety of different terms to point to Christ. Another example would be, we've talked about uh, the secret. Who is the secret of God? The Lord God will do nothing except He revealeth His secrets unto His servant, the prophets. Who is the secret? It is Christ again. The whole gospel, the whole Bible is about Christ, right? And that's why I don't think it's surprising to see all these different terms. God uses a variety of terms to point to the same person, the same entity, right? So there it is again. I propose that uh, the first resurrection of those that are rising first, they rise with Christ. And I think the uh, you know clue is really looking at the different groups or the different category of those that are rising and to show that it is uh, it means that apparently it is pointing to those that are uh, becoming saved. Saved in a sense that God is redeeming the body. Okay, now here's another reason. Take a look at verse 6. Blessed and holy is he that hath part. Hold on one second. That verse didn't post either. Uh, I'll come back to the thousand years. Uh, one second, Eric. Revelation chapter 20, verse 6. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. Well, that doesn't seem to make sense. Because if we go back to Revelation 20, verse 5, where it says, But the rest of the dead, and we said that the rest of the dead seems to point to those that are uh, living today at the time that Christ is revealed. Well, how, why would God say then that blessed and holy is he that have part in the first resurrection? Would this imply that those who died previously or prior to that, they're not taking part in the first resurrection. Can you see the, uh, the, the the point that I'm raising? So when God says here in verse 6, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection, there, there's no chronology there. It would simply seem to indicate that blessed and holy are those who belong to Christ. And that would be everyone, whether because the 144,000 has already been sealed, so whether it includes those who come with Christ spiritually as the Bible is unsealed or those that are living, that are being gathered today, they're still part of the same body. The body is not separated, right? And Christ is the head of the body. So blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection, I think is pointing to salvation. And that's why, you know, the rest of the dead there... Uh, you know, it, the, the language, the first resurrection, is not just uh, limited to those that are living today. On such a second death hath no power. They shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with them a thousand years. And Eric raised the question about the thousand years. Yeah, it, it does seem to get a little bit uh, complicated, right, Eric? Because God speaks about after the thousand years, or when the thousand years are expired giving the impression that uh, somehow there's a, a, a literal passage of time. And I don't think there is. I think we have to look at a lot of other language that God is using that establishes the, uh, the priority or what happens with the church coming into the Great Tribulation and God unsealing the Bible, bringing judgment. So in other words, when Satan is bound, he is bound for a thousand years, meaning that God has set him aside so that he would no longer deceive the nations. God begins to unseal the Bible, and now the elect, the believers, are coming out of Babylon. Now, at the end of the thousand years, it means that the next step, I believe, that God has, uh, that God plans for Satan, is that he is going to be loose. And that would be, uh, that would seem to be uh, confirmed by uh, a lot of other language I think we find, uh, especially in the book of Revelation. For example, the other day, 
we were talking about the woman receiving two wings of a great eagle. Uh, we talk about rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil. Is. Well, we know that the believers rejoice at the revelation of Christ. It is morning. Weeping endures for a night, but joy comes in the morning. And it's in the same context that God is telling us that woe to the inhabitants of the earth. Can you see the, the connection that I'm offering? Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you. So God now, it's at the end of the thousand years now, God is allowing Satan to go into perdition. Isn't that interesting? All right, but we can, uh, Lord willing, try and develop that some more, uh, perhaps another time. Okay, uh, Acts 26, verse 23. Again, we read, Christ should suffer and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead. So Christ was the first to rise. Now he is able to provide salvation. So those that are those that are rising first, I think it, uh, it's pointing to uh, the fact that they belong to Christ. They've died with Christ, buried with him in baptism, and they are risen at the same time. So they uh, belong to the group that take part in the first resurrection. All right, in the last section here, what about the 144? Yeah, the 144,000, that, that would include everyone. It includes, I believe, Bobby, those that were beheaded, hurt not the earth, neither the sea, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. But when Christ was revealed, even though I believe everyone, uh, you know, the 144,000 had been sealed, but guess what? We're still looking at another category of people who belong to the 144,000, except what language do we read today concerning them? What do we read about how God is uh, uh, dealing with those that are alive and remain? They are being gathered. God is bringing back their captivity. Can you see that? So even though we're looking at, uh, you know, historically we're looking at two separate uh, uh, groups, individuals, but they're all part, I believe, of the 144,000. And I think we'll see this here, unity of the faith, two groups rising with Christ. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. Now keep in mind that God has given us other information in the Bible that tell us that, uh, you know, he speaks of the 144,000 of the tribe of Benjamin, of the tribe of uh, Reuben, and so on. And now we read about the body itself coming to perfection. And who is the one that is perfect? Who is the one that is perfect? What does God mean here when he speaks of a perfect man. Yeah, it has to be Christ again. So can you see how it's all about Christ? He is the resurrection. He is the first ride, redemption. It's all about Christ. So now the body is coming to perfection. Christ is revealed. God is unsealing the Bible so that they understand time and judgment. But some today, perhaps, uh, they may not have understood you know what was happening with uh, God bringing judgment to Babylon, but God in due time would give him, you know, He would begin to give them a revelation. He provides uh, for the uh, the needs of uh, of the people, right? Babylon is falling. Come out of my people, Thomas. Hi, welcome. Okay, so we read about the the body coming to perfection. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 10. Has Christ already come? But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Has Christ, well, I was for a new car. Has Christ been revealed? Bear with me one second. Well, I was shopping for a new car. We... <laughs> All right. Uh, so, yeah, we read in verse 10, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. 
And we understand by the grace of God that Christ has been revealed, not physically or literally, but as the Bible is unsealed. So now all these verses that had always been in the Bible, you and I uh, you know, might begin to understand what they were really pointing to, God's judgment on Babylon. Jude chapter 1 verse 14, Enoch also the seventh from Adam prophesied of thee, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand, with ten thousands of his saints. Means that he comes with how many? Who do you suppose the ten thousands here might relate to? He comes with ten thousands of his saints. Yeah, he comes with all the elect. He comes with 144,000, except now we begin to see that God is separating. He is making a distinction between those that are still living. And he speaks of those as being gathered, which I believe is, uh, is what's going on today. Those that are gathered, they're, they're coming out of Babylon. Now, we don't know how long that is going to go on or uh, whether or not uh, someone might give evidence of this salvation God in his own time I propose Lord willing would uh, bring revelation to those uh, to the elect those that he planned to redeem behold I show you a mystery we shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed now the whole body is actually changed right how is the body changed it was corrupted it is sown in corruption. It is raised in glory. So the whole body is going to be changed. And we read here in verse 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall be raised and corruptible, and we shall be changed. Now, the dead in Christ rising here. You notice it says, and we shall be changed. I thank God... Uh, you know, is really including the entire body of Christ. Even though we, we read from some of these other verses, which I'm going to post in a minute, uh, God now begins to make a distinction between those that are uh, those that had previously died and those that are being gathered. First Thessalonians 4:14. If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, then which sleep in Jesus will God bring with Him. For this I say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive remain. We which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. There, I think, is when we see uh, that God begins to make uh, the distinction, the separation between uh, those that, you know, they died in Christ, they still belong to the body of Christ. Anyone here disagree with that? Even those that have died, they passed? Now let me ask you the question. Those that died prior to the revelation of Christ, did they come into the Great Tribulation? Now think about before you answer. Were they a part of the Great Tribulation? Were they in Tribulation? Yeah, precisely, Bobby. It is one body. So even though, yeah, you know, uh, we, we really have to think about that because we say, oh, well, then they, you know, those that have died and, and somehow they happen to be with the Lord. Now, <clears throat> that is true. But I think until the appointed time when God would actually, uh, when God would begin to unseal the Bible to those that are living today the whole body it is one body so if one member suffers all the members suffer with it because Christ is the head of the body so the body is never really separated from Christ does that make sense and that's why I think uh, you know we we might be able to tie this language in the way God has given it to us here the dead in Christ shall rise first first Thessalonians 4:16. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel. 
and the dead in Christ shall rise first. So there it is again. I propose that rising first has everything to do with uh, taking part in the first resurrection. However, in verse 17, then which were, we which are alive remain shall be caught up. So God's plan now is to pick up the rest of the body. But it doesn't mean that they were not raised with Christ. Does that make sense? Even though God had to go through the motion of gathering them. He shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds. Matthew 24, verse 31. See the connection there, Lord willing? And what is the four winds pointing to? It's an interesting term again. Uh, I think eventually we might tie in or relate to yeah yeah uh, you're correct I was thinking uh, you know the church itself or the body of Christ but the body of Christ is really uh, I don't think we can limit it to the uh, the institution of the church in other words the walls of the building it is the whole world so wherever the believers are today because antichrists are everywhere I believe many shall come in my name so God is really gathering them from the body itself from uh, the four winds which happens to be the entire world right so that seems to make sense in Revelation uh, chapter 11 verse 12 and they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them come up hither so again what I'm offering is that the whole body is rising in Christ the whole body takes part in the first resurrection but then one part of the body is really looking at those who come with Christ spiritually as the word is unsealed. And then the other part are those that are gathered. They're brought in. They're catching up. Right? Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in the cloud and their enemies beheld them. And then finally we read uh, in John 5, 28, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming. One hour. All that are in the graves. And the hour there... It's not just talking about the hour on the clock, right? Or the very last day. Although there might be an implication there. But the day and the hour. Uh, Eric writes, is heaven a picture of the saved body? Yes. Uh, more specifically, Eric, which heaven would you say uh, this is? Which heaven? Which heaven uh, is really uh, of concern today? Is God dealing with the new heavens and the new earth, right? The new spiritual body. The one where, right, uh, there are no more strangers in this body. In a sense that uh, the perfection of God, it, 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 it takes shape in a sense where God is unsealing the Bible. Truth is revealed. And that's how I believe God is perfecting the body. Okay, uh, a very quick conclusion, hopefully. I might be able to post up. Nope. Hold on one second. Post it in two parts. The first resurrection seems to point to Christ himself. That, I believe, is the, um, that I believe is, is, the, is the sticking point, if you will. That's the one thing that, for me, it was making it difficult to understand the language of 1 Thessalonians 4.16, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and Revelation 20, verse 5, this is the first resurrection. But once we understand, Lord willing, that the first resurrection is really pointing to Christ himself, that seems to change the whole thing. That seems to shed light on these verses it is really looking at the redemption of of the body of Christ so those who rise first or to take part those who take part in the first resurrection seems to be pointing to the redemption of the body even though God makes a distinction between those who previously died and those that are gathered right and those that are gathered I propose 
are they now becoming saved? When we talk about those that are gathered today, are they just becoming saved? Or does it seem that while they were already saved, being a part of the 144,000, and God now is redeeming them, He is bringing them out of Babylon. That's the picture, Lord willing, I, I, I think, I believe the Bible is giving us. Because if we say that, well, uh, God is, uh, you know, individually, He is bringing these into the kingdom, well, that, that seems to be plausible, and, and, you know, that's something that I would like to believe. Uh, only problem there is that that would seem to uh, contradict a number of other verses that uh, we've talked about in the room. Okay, uh, that's all I have uh, for now in this study. Uh, bear with me one second.